The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Hello, friends and family. Day 241 of reading and studying through the Bible in 365. Today we are in Ezekiel chapters 9 through 12. But before we get started, I just wanted to share something really cool. Uh, we said our final goodbyes to my dad yesterday, and God is still so faithful, so good, as I said in that scripture from Lamentations. But when we went back to his house, I was given this um, from my stepmom and she said that this was his bible <laughs> and this couldn't have been a more precious gift to me uh, my sister and i both kind of we didn't fight over it she was going to take it and then she said you know what you go ahead and take it and i just said you don't know how much this means to me i mean you know just seeing that he kept this uh and knowing that there was some faith there and we also had another sort of confirmation yesterday when my uncle called us just as i was getting out of the car to board my flight and he told us that he actually you know reconciled with my dad a couple of months ago and he just straight up asked my dad do you have a relationship with the lord and my uncle said he said yes so praise report there i felt like that was such uh, a the hand of God and a confirmation because my middle sister had been praying for a confirmation for my older sister because I think she was really the one struggling uh, with wondering if my dad was saved. I was somewhere in the middle of that. My middle sister was like, I 100% believe, no doubt in my mind. And you know, I was hopeful. And so uh, we were all praying for confirmation on our own. Like that was a specific word that we had prayed, Lord, give us confirmation. And I believe that that was it. And so, so grateful for this gift and that gift that the Lord gave to us in that confirmation. So, you know, it's a new day. God's mercies are new today. His joy is renewed within me. I feel like there's such a weight lifted off of my shoulders. Um, there was such a finality and closure in seeing him yesterday at the funeral home. So it's all good. Thank you so much. I'm so extra grateful for this community once again, for your prayers, for your comfort, for your grace. I really see how it is such a blessing on all of us. So thank you for that. And uh, let's pray because we want to welcome the Lord here as we read his word today. Lord, we thank you so much for allowing us to wake up with your renewed joy within our spirits and our hearts. And I thank you for your mercies that are new. I can't stop saying it because I have such a greater understanding of what that means today more than ever. And so I am just grateful for that. Grateful for you, oh God, for being our comforter, for being the one who loves us with an everlasting love and for wrapping your arms around us every time, Lord, we are feeling a little lonely, a little bit hurt or discomforted. And so we just come to you today with open arms, Lord, asking you to please speak to our hearts. Will you open up our hearts, our eyes and our ears in such a way that we are able to receive from you a very specific message. I pray for revelation from your word today, Lord. Help us to understand it with accuracy. And I just pray that it will be a blessing, Lord, that your word will remain true to what it says, that it will never return void. And we are so thankful for this word today, thankful to Jesus for what you have done, for being the word in flesh, and uh, knowing that you are our hope for the future and that you are going to come back renew everything, right every wrong, turn everything upside down. And we just look forward to that day, whether we are still on this earth or not. And so I just pray that you please forgive us of our sins, reveal to us what we need to do in order to make changes to be more righteous, Lord, that we will be changed from glory to glory, but that needs to uh, have some sort of personal responsibility with it. So I pray that you'll show us what that is. And let us come together in unity today, one heart, one mind, one thought. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. 
So here in chapter 9, the temple vision of Ezekiel continues. Then he cried in my ears with a loud voice, saying, Bring near the executioners of the city, each with his destroying weapon in his hand. Now these executioners are some sort of angelic being. They were given this divine instruction to take out the people, to destroy. And behold, six men came from the direction of the upper gate, which faces north, each with his weapon for slaughter in his hand. And with them was a man clothed in linen with a riding case at his waist. And they went in and stood beside the bronze altar. Even though we don't know who exactly this man clothed in linen was, it Im the implicit nature of this is that it's the Holy Spirit uh, because linen usually represents purity and righteousness. And the only one pure and righteous would be God himself. So therefore the Holy Spirit. Now the glory of God of Israel had gone up from the cherub on which it rested to the threshold of the house. So the glory of God is slowly going to be leaving the temple at this point. The glory left the temple. It leaves Jerusalem. It leaves Judah. And he called to the man clothed in linen, who had the writing case at his waist. And the Lord said to him, Pass through the city, through Jerusalem, and put a mark on the foreheads of the men who sigh and groan over all of the abominations that are committed to it. So these men would be the ones who are most likely still righteous, who are groaning over what is going on. And in Revelation 7, this actually mirrors the time when the Jews will be marked on the forehead. And this will be the 144,000 that will be marked, uh, likely being 12,000 from each tribe. And we, of course, are marked by the Holy Spirit. So this mark in the Hebrew is the word Tau, which is either a, an X or it was written in the form of a cross back in this day. So this is sort of the remnant that we're speaking of, the righteous remnant. And to the others, he said, in my hearing, pass through the city after him and strike. Your eyes shall not spare and you shall show no pity. Kill old men outright, young men and maidens, little children and women, but touch no one on whom is the mark. So this is sort of indicative of also the Passover, you know, when the people were uh, had the mark on their doorposts of the blood and the wrath of God would pass over them and begin at my sanctuary, of course, it was the leaders who were leading the people astray, and God's judgment will begin at his house. So they began with the elders who were before the house. Then he said to them, Defile the house and fill the courts with the slain. Go out. So they went out and struck in the city. And while they were striking and I was left alone, I fell upon my face and I cried, Oh, Lord God, will you destroy all the remnant of Israel in the outpouring of your wrath on Jerusalem? So remember when he said, ah, before, I don't remember exactly where that was, but this is a different type of awe. This time it is in sincere pain. His awe is this true uh, sense of you know, this this mourning or this painful feeling that he's got within him and that he's expressing. Then he said to me, the guilt of the house of Israel and Judah is exceedingly great. The land is full of blood and the city full of injustice. For they say, the Lord has forsaken the land and the Lord does not see. But as for me, my eye will not spare, nor will I have pity. I will bring their deeds upon their heads. So of course, they are receiving this judgment based upon their own actions. They brought this upon themselves once again. And behold, the man clothed in linen with the riding case at his waist brought back word saying, I have done as you commanded me. Jesus spoke a very similar passage in John chapter 17, basically saying that he has done exactly what God the Father has called him to do. And in this case, this is indicative of the angel being obedient. And angels typically were like this. They were diligent in their work and they were accountable to God. Chapter 10. Then I looked and behold, on the expanse that was over their heads of the cherubim, so kind of like the sky above them, there appeared above them something like a sapphire, in appearance like a throne. And he said to the man clothed in linen, go in among the whirling wheels underneath the cherubim, fill your hands with the burning coals from between the cherubim and scatter them over the city. So these coals will be coals of judgment. And the fact that they are going to be thrown on the city will set the city on fire. So it will be this all-consuming fire. And he went in before my eyes 
Now the cherubim were standing on the south side of the house when the man went in, and a cloud filled the inner court. And the glory of the Lord went up from the cherub to the threshold of the house, and the house was filled with the cloud. So the glory of God is on the move at this point. And the court was filled with the brightness of the glory of the Lord. And the sound of the wings of the cherubim was heard as far as the outer court, like the voice of God Almighty when he speaks. And when he commanded the man clothed in linen, take fire from between the whirling wheels from between the cherubim, he went in and stood beside a wheel and a cherub stretched out his hand. So this goes to show that even the cherub had to keep a safe distance from God or else they might be burned. So he just stretch out his hand from between the cherubim to the fire that was between the cherubim and took some of it and put it into the hands of the man clothed in linen who took it out, who took it and went out. The cherubim appeared to have the form of a human hand under their wings. So he is, or they are, being completely obedient, no questions asked, and he is doing the exact thing that God called him to do. And I looked, and behold, there were four wheels beside the cherubim, one beside each cherub, and the appearance of the wheels was like sparkling burl, which... Many of you have confirmed that this is a green color. Thank you. And as for their appearance, the four had the same likeness as if a wheel were within a wheel. So this is going to describe kind of this orderly nature of God and this ceaseless activity. So they are not standing still here. They are on the move. They're working in a coordinated fashion and they're moving together. When they went, they went in any of their four directions without turning as they went, but in whatever direction the front wheel faced, the others followed without turning as they went. And their whole body, their rims and their spokes, their wings and the wheels were full of eyes all around. The wheels that the four of them had. As for the wheels, they were called in my hearing, the whirling wheels and every one had four faces the first face was the face of the cherub and the second face was a human face and the third face of a lion and the fourth the face of an eagle so this is descriptive of what we saw in chapter one and the cherubim mounted up these were the living creatures that i saw by the kibar canal and when the cherubim went the wheels went beside them and when the cherubim lifted up their wings to mount up from the earth, the wheels did not turn from beside them. When they stood still, these stood still. And when they mounted up, these mounted up with them, for the spirit of the living creatures was in them. Then the glory of the Lord went out from the threshold of the house. So notice it's still on the move. It is continuing to go further from the temple and stood over the cherubim. And the cherubim lifted up their wings and mounted up from the earth before my eyes as they went out with the wheels beside them. And they stood at the entrance of the east gate of the house of the Lord and the glory of the God of Israel was over them. So they were basically like guardians and they moved in step with the spirit. So Jesus by the way, will also return through the east gate. So the east gate being something of significance here. These were the living creatures that I saw underneath the God of Israel by the Kibar Canal, and I knew that they were cherubim. Each had four faces, each four wings, and underneath their wings the likeness of human hands. And as for the likeness of their faces, they were the same faces whose appearance I had seen by the Kibar Canal. Each one of them went straight forward. So while he did not identify these four creatures in chapter one as cherubim, now he confirms these are in fact cherubim. And the fact that they are moving straight forward just goes to show that there is no thwarting the plan of God and that they would not deviate from his plan. Chapter 11, the vision continues. The spirit lifted me up and brought me to the east gate. So again, glory on the move. It's now out of the temple of the house of the Lord, which faces east. And behold, at the entrance of the gateway, there were 25 men. And I saw among the, them Jeazaniah, the son of Azar, and Pelatiah, the son of Benaiah, princes of the people. So the princes of the people uh, may have described the civic leaders, the public and political officials, um, these people who are over the judicial, military, and royal posts. This could also be the same 26 people that he saw uh, in the earlier chapters and those who were worshiping the sun. And he said to me, son of man, these are the men who devise iniquity and who give wicked counsel in this city, who say this time is not near to build houses. This city is the cauldron and we are the meat. So they are basically thinking that they are safe from any kind of heat. They are sitting comfortably in the cauldron in this crock pot. 
<laughs> Therefore, prophesy against them or prophesy against them. Prophesy, O son of man. So they kind of thought that the judgment was far off at this point. And the spirit of the Lord fell upon me and he said to me, say, thus says the Lord. So you think, O house of Israel, for I know the things that come into your mind. You have multiplied your slain in the city and have filled its streets with the slain. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, your slain, whom have laid in the midst of it, they are meat and this city is the cauldron. But you shall be brought out of the midst of it. You shall, or you have feared the sword and I will bring the sword upon you, declares the Lord God. And I will bring you out of the midst of it and give you into the hands of foreigners and execute judgments upon you. You shall fall by the sword. I will judge you at the border of Israel and you shall know that I am the Lord. This city shall not be your cauldron, nor shall you be the meat in the midst of it. So basically he's telling them at this point, you're not safe. You thought that you were, you thought you were, you know, choice cuts of meat in this safe cauldron, but you're not. And you're basically going to be cooked at this point. This city shall not be your cauldron. We said that, uh, nor shall you be the midst of the meat in the midst of it. I will judge you at the border of Israel and you shall know that I am the Lord. For you have not walked in my statutes nor obeyed my rules, but have acted according to the rules of the nations that are around you. So he is reiterating the very thing that Jeremiah spoke. And it came to pass while I was prophesying that Pelatiah, the son of Benaiah, died. Then I fell down on my face and I cried out with a loud voice saying, Ah, oh, Lord God, will you make a full end of the remnant of Israel? So the fact that he sees a leader die, he is thinking, okay, all the people are going to perish. And the word of the Lord came to me, son of man, your brothers, or your, the other exiles among you, even your brothers, your kinsmen, the whole house of Israel, all of them are those of whom the inhabitants of Jerusalem have said, go far from the Lord to us. This land is given for possession. Therefore say, thus says the Lord God, though I remove them far off, uh, among the nations and though I scattered them among the countries yet I have been a sanctuary to them for a while in the countries where they have gone so this sanctuary meaning technically holy place or set apart place but really God is saying that no matter where you have been scattered I continue to be this safe place for you you know to bring this to conclusion, Jews are actually the only ethnic group who have been able to maintain their identity, their culture, their belief system outside of their homeland. They were scattered for 2000 years and yet God remained their sanctuary, their safe place and was able to preserve all of that. Therefore say, thus says the Lord God, I will gather you from the peoples and assemble you out of the countries where you've been scattered and I will give you the land of Israel. So he is saying, I'm going to regather you. And then when they came there or come there, they will remove from it all the detestable things and all its abominations. And I will give them one heart and a new spirit and I will put within them. I will remove the heart of stone from their flesh and give them a heart of flesh that they may walk in my statutes and keep my rules and obey them. And they shall be my people and I will be their God. But as for those whose heart goes after their detestable things and their abominations, I will bring their deeds upon their own heads, declares the Lord God. So after he regathers them, there will be a removal of the hard-heartedness and of their abominations. So there will be some sort of cleansing before he can renew them or transform their heart completely. So renewing them will ultimately empower them to be able to maintain their righteousness and their unity. Then the cherubim lifted up their wings with the wheels beside them, and the glory of the God of Israel was over them. And the glory of the Lord went up from the midst of the city and stood on the mountain that is on the east side of the city. And the Spirit lifted me up and brought me in the vision by the Spirit of God into Chaldea, to the exile. So now he's in Babylon. Then the vision that I had seen went up from me, and I told the exiles all the things that the Lord had shown me. So his whole purpose here, by being on top of the mountain, is hoping that they would then turn to him. This mountain being the Mount of Olives. And again, this whole purpose of God doing these things is so that he can restore his relationship with his children. So here in chapter 12, the word of the Lord came to me, son of man, you dwell in the midst of a rebellious house who have eyes to see, but see not, who have ears to hear, but hear not, for they are a rebellious house. 
Now, this terminology here has been used several times in the Bible. It's also used by Moses, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Jesus even said it, you know, talking about having ears that hear and eyes that see. As for you, son of man, prepare for yourself an exile's baggage. So he's going to be painting them some sort of picture here and go into exile by day in their sight. You shall go like an exile from your place to another place in their sight. And perhaps they will understand, though they are a rebellious house. So he's saying, I need you to act this out. Go into exile so you can show their fate at this point. You shall bring out your baggage by day in their sight as who must go into exile. Oh, excuse me, as baggage for exile, and you shall go out for yourself at evening in their sight as those do who must go into exile. In their sight, dig through the wall and bring your baggage out through it. In their sight, you shall lift the baggage upon your shoulders and carry it out at dusk. You shall cover your face that you may not see the land, for I have made you a sign for the house of Israel. So this is going to depict their desperate escape and the fact that they cannot expect a quick return back to their uh, their land. And I did as I was commanded. I brought out my baggage by day as baggage for exile. And in the evening, I dug through the wall with my own hands. I brought out my baggage at dusk, carrying it out on my shoulder in their sight. So notice that he did exactly what God told him to do. He obeyed first before he, before he knew what the next step was. And this is what we are called to do as well. When God calls, we obey, and then we get the next instruction. Now in the morning, the word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, has not the house of Israel, the rebellious house, said to you, what are you doing? So they kind of think he's nuts here and are asking him, what in the world is going on? Say to them, thus says the Lord God, the oracle concerns the prince in Jerusalem and all the house of Israel who are in it. Say, I am a sign for you as I have done, so shall it be done to them. They shall go into exile, into captivity. So this is all being spoken in 592 BC. And of course it is fulfilled six years later in Jeremiah 39. And the prince who is among them shall lift his baggage upon his shoulder at dusk and shall go out. They shall dig through the wall to bring him out through it. He shall cover his face in sort of like this defeat posture that he may not see the land with his eyes. Now this is all speaking of Zedekiah. Remember when he tries to escape and they catch him at the wall. And even though it says that he shall not see the land, it doesn't mean that he won't enter the land. What it means is they're going to gouge his eyes out and therefore he will not physically see it. And I will spread my net over him and he shall be taken in my snare. And I will bring him to Babylon, the land of the Chaldeans. Yet he shall not see it and he shall die there. And I will scatter toward every wind all who are around him, his helpers and all his troops. And I will unsheathe the sword after them. And they shall know that I am the Lord. When I disperse them among the nations and scatter them among the countries. But I will let a few of them escape from the sword, from famine and pestilence, that they may declare all their abominations among the nations where they go and may know that I am the Lord. So notice that he is judging his people before he uh, goes to the other people. He is judging them at his very house. And when he says, you will know that I am the Lord, he is using the personal and covenantal name of Yahweh, which just goes to show how much of a caring God that he is to remind them of that. And the word of the Lord came to me, son of man, eat your bread with quaking and drink water with trembling and with anxiety. So this goes to show how fearful they were at this point. And say to the people of the land, thus says the Lord God concerning the inhabitants of Jerusalem in the land of Israel, they shall eat their bread with anxiety and drink water in dismay. So this was life for them at the most basic level that they can't even eat and drink without having fear and anxiety. So a very tragic condition for them to be in. In this way, her land will be stripped of all its contains, all of its, wait, sorry. Her land will be stripped of all it contains on account of the violence of all those who dwell in it. And the inhabited cries shall be laid waste and the land shall become a desolation. And you shall know that I am the Lord. And the word of the Lord came to me, son of man, what is this proverb that you have about the land of Israel saying, the days grow long and every vision comes to nothing. Tell them, therefore, thus says the Lord God, I will put an end to this proverb and they shall no more use it as a proverb in Israel. But say to them, the days are near and the fulfillment of every vision. 
For there shall be no more any false vision or flattering divination within the house of Israel. For I am the Lord. I will speak the word that I speak, and it will be performed. It will no longer be delayed, but in your days, O rebellious house, I will speak the word and perform it, declares the Lord. So they were basically very cynical and apathetic, thinking that this delayed judgment meant that there would be no judgment. But of course, things are changing here. He's like, no, I'm going to turn that proverb around and you are going to see that judgment is upon you. And the word of the Lord came to me, son of man, behold, they of the house of Israel say, the vision that he sees is for many days from now. And he prophesies of times far off. So again, they are still thinking that their judgment is delayed. Therefore say to them, thus says the Lord God, none of my words will be delayed any longer, but the word that I speak will be performed, declares the Lord God. So this is showing how important it is for us to understand, to read, and to really acknowledge the power of prophecy and how it directly impacts our present actions. So for them, they needed to get it together and presently act in such a way that they were repentant, that they were turned toward God, that they were righteous, that would be their present actions. And we too have to recognize that all of the prophecy that we read in the Bible is going to come to pass. There is a surety about it, that even the way that God commands here, and therefore we need to be ready. Our present actions need to reflect what this word is saying. Today could be the day. No one really knows. Jesus doesn't even know. Only the Father in heaven knows when Jesus will return. So we'll end here with a heart checked. Are your actions today something that is coming out of your knowledge of past prophecies and how they affect our future? So I thank you, Lord, for this word here, for your faithfulness. And some of us might be a little confused, Lord, like, I'm, I don't know. I don't know if what I'm doing today is in line with what God wants me to do. I don't know if this is in line with what prophecy states. And that is okay, God. You don't expect us to be all-knowing because none of us are. Only you are. It is impossible for us to understand all things. But I just pray little by little you will start to reveal things to us, Lord, so that we are able to receive step by step, instruction by instruction, word by word, and we will continue to just build upon that. But may we not delay in action, God, when you call us to do something. May we then start to turn our wheels and move straight forward just as the angelic heavenly beings did. May we be obedient as the prophets were, Lord. I thank you so much, God, for reminding us of how important obedience is today. So I just pray, Lord, that as we move one foot in front of the other, that it will be done in accordance to your will. We love you so much. In Jesus' name, amen. Heaven is a divine gift to us that is given by grace. We're not going to get it because we are indeed righteous. We are getting it because God loves us. But again, we will not receive that promised land. We will not receive that gift of eternal life if we don't receive Jesus. So I wanna give someone that opportunity today who is saying, I've never done that. I've never given my life to Christ. I don't know where I'm gonna go after I die, but I see now that that is real and I want to believe. So if that is you, we're gonna say a prayer I'm going to put the words on the screen so you can say them audibly with your mouth because the Bible says that when you believe and when you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, that he died and he rose again, then you will be saved. So let's pray this prayer, believe it in your heart, speak it with your mouth, and know that this is indeed the day of your salvation. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for Jesus. Jesus, thank you for dying for me. I believe that you came you died and you rose again. I thank you that all of my sins are forgiven. I confess of my sin, I turn from them, and I live my life for you. So I receive you now as Lord and Savior of my life. I belong to you, Jesus. I pray these things in Jesus' name, amen.